called the rebound technique, the confession of our sins, which we name and cite to God the Father to ensure the filling of God the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor. So with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this evening in praise and in worship and in glorification of your name and also the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for all the logistical grace blessings that you have provided for us and our family. We thank you for our, the great uh, nation that you've given to us, all the freedoms and prosperity that we have within this country. We thank you for our strong military that stands on guard on our behalf around the world. And we ask that you be with all of those in our civilian government and also our military and especially those in leadership positions. We ask that you watch over them, protect and guide them, allow them to be successful in all their endeavors, and allow them to continue to uphold and honor our Constitution and your word. And Father, we also pray for those who have been wounded on the battlefield. We ask that you bring healing into their lives. And we also pray for the families of those who have lost loved ones on the battlefield. And we thank you, Father, for their service and sacrifice, and also be with their loved ones and ultimately bring healing and comfort into their souls by your word and by your spirit. So, Father, again, we thank you for this day that you've given to us and the church that you have provided for us, and now the word that you are giving to us this evening. And we ask that you enlighten us by your spirit. In Christ's name, amen. All right, if Mary Ellen could come forward for our doxology. And if you could all rise, please. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name, sing like never before. O oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Amen, and please be seated. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much for the doxology. Now let's go to our Bible, let's turn to Ephesians. In chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, where are my glasses? Here they are. <clears throat> All right. And as you know, our memory verse uh, begins with Ephesians 5.18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is a waste of life, or that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we are commanded not to operate and function in sin, but instead have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And again, that is ensured when we confess our sins and have fellowship with God, because again, you can't be filled with the Spirit if you don't have fellowship with God uh, based on sin upon your soul. So confess your sins, you have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And as Ephesians tells us, and what we're going to see throughout this book, we are commanded to walk in that Spirit on a consistent basis. So this evening, we continue on with our introduction to the book of Ephesians. And uh, as we uh, have uh, started on Tuesday night, I'm giving you somewhat of an introduction. On Tuesday, I told you a little bit about the New Testament, uh, its place, the book of Ephesians, its place within the New Testament, the importance of that book, and uh, some of the main themes uh, that we're going to note as we go throughout that book. This evening, what I want to do for you is give you a little bit of historical background in regard to the Ephesians and also the city of Ephesus. And so that's what we're going to do this evening as we go through that and understand a little bit more about the people that Paul was serving and the people that Paul was writing to during that time. But let's just look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the opening salutation that uh, Paul gives to these individuals. And as I shared with you on uh, Tuesday evening, uh, many of the, or several of the ancient, which means the oldest Greek translations that we now have found and discovered, do not have that little phrase in there, at Ephesus, 
in the original language. So basically, this just is uh, Paul is saying to the saints who are what? Faithful in Christ Jesus. So literally, this book is not written to the specific area of the Ephesians and that city specifically, but ultimately to that entire region uh, that is in Asia Minor, where Paul had gone on his various missionary journeys and established many churches. But we know for a fact that Paul did spend a lot of time in Ephesus, and he uh, stopped there on his second missionary journey. He then went through there and ended his third missionary journey in Ephesus, and then he also spent three years or up to three years uh, in Ephesus being their pastor teacher and having that as the central, uh, the, the headquarters, as we would say, for the entire region and getting the, uh, the gospel message out there to that region of Asia Minor. So uh, this evening we're going to talk a little bit more about Ephesus and the Ephesians to give you a little understanding of the culture. Now remember, when we study the Bible, remember we use the ICE principle, isagogics, categorical, exegetical. Isagogics ultimately is talking about the history, uh, understanding the Word of God from the day in which it was written, from the history that we see within the Bible. That's what we call isagogics. So we go back, understand what was going on in, at that time and the people that Paul was writing to so that we can relate that better to us today. Categorical means we study the Bible uh, by category, which means doctrines of the Bible. We look at not just one verse and pull it out of context, but we combine chapter and verse throughout Scripture, especially within the New Testament, and understand the totality of the doctrine that is being taught in any specific verse. And then exegetical, as you know, is uh, studying the word in the original languages, both the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Aramaic. So that's what we uh, are doing, and tonight it's an exagogics exercise, again, studying the history of the uh, Ephesian and uh, the Ephesian people or the city of Ephesus is what we're going to do this evening. So I've got a couple of maps here. I've showed you that one. Well, let me go back to that first map, which this one's a little grainy, a little blurry. Uh, don't like it as much, but uh, here we have Jerusalem down in the bottom uh, uh, right-hand corner, and ultimately Israel being there on the Mediterranean Sea, as you know. Antioch, the place where Paul be, uh, began and where Paul kind of came from on Damascus area as well, but Antioch being one of the epicenters of uh, Christianity back in the day. But then Ephesus being over here, and this whole area and this whole region was known in that day as Asia Minor. And so as the province of Asia and Asia Minor, as they called it, again, that city of Ephesus was right there on the coastline and uh, also on the coastline of what is on the other side of the Greek or uh, Greece as we would know it today. And as you know somewhat about the history of Greece, uh, basically this was di uh, various regions and provinces, and they were individual states at that time. And it wasn't until Alexander the Great came along where they ultimately united the entire Greek empire and uh, brought them together. And uh, so that Greek empire not only uh, dealt with this region here, but also in the Ephesus region as we know. And the Greek empire that uh, came before and then after Alexander ultimately flowed over into what we know as Asia Minor and uh, basically what is Turkey today. So when we talk about the people of Ephesus, there is a large Greek influence basically that determined uh, you know, their heritage and their background and what was going on uh, in their day and age. So again, in modern day, we call all of this Turkey. And you have these various cities here, but on the coastline over here, and again, the Greek islands come right up to that coastline, but ultimately Ephesus is right there on the, uh, what we would call the west coast of Turkey as we know it today. And so that's the region in which we're talking about. That is the place where it was the capital for Paul to establish the church, uh, the early church. It was a base of operation for him. Later on, it became a base of operation for John the Apostle as well. He spent many years there and probably wrote uh, his gospel, uh, or excuse me, uh, his epistle from that place, 1 John as we know, ultimately in, uh, from Ephesus as the epicenter for religion and Christianity in that day. So basically a little bit of history about the Ephesus and uh, the city itself. It was located at the mouth of what is called the Caister River, and ultimately that's on the east side of the Aegean Sea. Again, the west coast of uh, Turkey, but ultimately the east coast or the east, uh, eastern side of the Aegean Sea. And the city of Ephesus was a very important city. It was a large commercial city, a large political city, and then also a large religious city as well. 
And I'm going to show you a map a little bit. Well, in, in just a second, I'm going to show you a map of what that city looked like. And as we, well, I'll get it up there now so uh, you can see what it's all about. But ultimately, when we look at this map, you're seeing all kinds of different temples that were established in this city. And so this is what this city, uh, the outline of the city was back in the day. And here you see, again, the uh, overall map, and again, the uh, Aegean Sea being here, Greek o uh, Greece over there, the Greek islands in between, uh, this being Turkey or Asia Minor in the day, and Ephesus being right there. Now we blow that up, and we look at uh, the rest of this map or drawing, and ultimately, this is the city itself of Ephesus. What was important about this city and what made, gave it its uh, great prominence were a couple of things, but first and foremost, this little canal and the, uh, the, the bay uh, that they had there. And again, it was a great uh, a bay that ships could come in, and ultimately the ships would come in and they would also be part of main roads and highways back in the day where they could then ship and distribute uh, materials and products throughout Asia and then all, all the way into Persia and down into Israel as well if they desired to do so. But there was a great port there and a great port city. As you know, most of the ancient ports uh, 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 and uh, most uh, major cities in the olden days were based on ports, especially here in the United States. Most of your major cities started on the coasts and ports uh, where people were coming and going and goods could flow in and out. But ultimately, uh, they, they had this uh, seafaring uh, uh, ability to bring in all kinds of products. Now, just to point out a few things here, again, they had a couple of gymnasiums, okay, a couple of different athletic venues where they would have exercise and various kind of games uh, back in the ancient Olympic games. So they had the gymnasium of, of Vettius here. Uh, where's the other? There's a, the Eastern Gymnasium. They had another one over here in the city. As you also know, in the ancient days, they would also wall their cities. That was a form of protection to keep out uh, enemies and armies and uh, even small bands of raiders that would want to come in and attack people. So the cities were their form of, uh, walls were their form of protection back in the day. There was a Mount Pion kind of in the middle of it, and then a Mount uh, Karasan, uh, or Karosos uh, there at the bottom. Uh, and uh, so a couple of hills uh, in regard to the city and it being built around it. But then you also see that there, were a no, uh, that there were a number of temples. This one is just considered a temple, uh, probably a Jewish synagogue. But then we have down here the temple of Hestius uh, Bo Boea. Uh, you have a temple down there. Then you have the temple of uh, Sir Serapis over here. There was a great library there, the Library of Celsus, and a uh, fantastic library, uh, uh, very much... Uh, um, uh, 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 equal to the uh, librarian in Alexandria, uh, Alexandria in Egypt, which was the greatest library of all time uh, that we uh, knew about in the ancient world, but ultimately that burned, as you know. There was also a great amphitheater. I've got some pictures of that I'm going to uh, share with you this evening. A great theater there, hold uh, up to 24,000 people. Uh, the Agora, but basically that was a great marketplace, and that's where people would sell their goods and uh, wares and, and whatnot and have commerce exchange there. Up by the uh, gymnasium at the top, again, there was another large stadium there where they would have different sporting events back in the day. But one of the things that Ephesus was probably most popular and, and most known about uh, was the temple of, in this map it says the Temple of Diana, which ultimately is the Latin and the Roman word that was given to that temple, but the real name that the Greeks had for that was the Temple of Artemis. And the Temple of Artemis was there, a very large temple that I'm going to share with you uh, in just a minute. So uh, let me show you this slide and ultimately give you some of the ad information. So basically, the, uh, they were best known for that magnificent temple, Artemis, Diana in the Latin, and it was completed around 550 B.C., and it existed for many, many years. Sometimes it was destroyed and then rebuilt and then ultimately destroyed, as you know. And uh, there are ruins. I'm going to show you a map of some of the ruins uh, uh, that exist of that temple uh, today. But it was so large, it was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And you all probably know about that from uh, your encyclopedias and history classes, if they still teach that in school today. Uh, but uh, back in the day when we went to school, um, uh, they taught these things. But it was one of the seven great wonders of the world. It was a fantastic temple. Uh, 
uh, it, and, uh, but ultimately to the goddess Artemis in the Greek uh, mythology and the Greek, uh, uh, as we would call it, false god or pagan religions. Now, this, uh, this temple was built on a site that had a previous pagan goddess temple there called Anta, uh, uh, Anatolina, and Anatolina was also known as the fertility goddess. And so when, they, when, when the uh, Greeks came in, or the Ionians, as I will also say, which later on some of them became Greeks, ultimately when they came in, they then took that same location and they built the Temple of Artemis. Again, another goddess, again, Artemis, I always think of that as a male word, because uh, a male name, because I'm thinking art, but it actually was a female. And it was a female pagan goddess that they worshipped at that place and built a magnificent structure that was uh, just enormous. And um, the, the structure was so large that it was four times the size of the Roman pantheon, which again was one of their great structures to their false gods uh, back in Rome. So it was an absolute magnificent uh, structure and building, but unfortunately worshipping a pagan and a false god or goddess, as we would say. And uh, you could also, uh, ancient Roman coins that have been found in various archaeological digs have, been, have shown to have the symbol of Artemis, or the goddess Ar Ar Artemis, on the back of the coins. Ultimately, uh, you know, where, where the Romans adopted this false religion and brought it into, you know, part of their pagan worship and part of their pagan religions as well. So this slide that I have for you shows you a picture. Did it go there? Let me see. It doesn't want to go. Let me get it over there. So this picture shows you some of the ruins uh, that are left from that ancient structure and uh, basically some of the mammoth uh, uh, pillars that were uh, created. Again, you know, you know, rows and rows and rows of these pillars. I'm going to show you a picture of what the overall structure looked like uh, in an artist's rendition in just a minute. But various pillars that were made, and you can kind of see the outline of, uh, of, the, uh, of the temple itself on the ground there. And you see some people over here to give you some context to the size of the structure and the building. But again, this was all part of the false god and false worship uh, from back in the day where they worshipped this false uh, fertility god who also took on uh, kind of another, uh, a, another uh, important significance as well. So again, the famous temple of Artemis was built at a sacred site of the ancient, uh, oh, I said this already, but just to give it to you in your notes, Antelina, the fertility goddess uh, that, would, uh, that came before the, uh, the Greeks had, had come in and taken over the land and then ultimately uh, rebuilt the temple. Now, what's interesting about this is that in Greek cult and myth, Artemis is called or known as, let me make sure I don't have this on the slide, uh, I'll get it on a slide. So I'm going to wait on that. I'm going to wait on that. So let me show you this picture. So this is the oddest rendition of what this structure would have been like and what it would look like back in the day. And again, just a fantastic structure. All open air, as you can see. You know, pillars uh, you know, that uh, would line pretty much the outside, and there would be a, a center part in the middle uh, where ultimately that would be open without pillars, uh, and that would where the priests would come and do their various things, or the priestess would come and do their various services and sacrifices and whatever, uh, worshiping the, the false ancient god, uh, or goddess uh, Artemis. And up at the top, you can see, again, a rendition of uh, uh, a, um, a statue that would be uh, 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 that was uh, uh, carved out in her image as well. We would call that a false idol. I'm going to show you some pictures of that in just a minute. Okay? So from the Greek point of view, back in the day, uh, the Ephesian Artemis, now this, uh, this goddess Artemis ultimately was known in, in various uh, areas and regions, uh, and uh, various uh, cultures would worship to that god in the and the goddess of fertility. But the Ephesus Artemis was very unique, and it was distinctive from the other uh, goddesses that, of Artemis that were in other regions and in other cultures. And so in the Greek cult and myth, Artemis is known to be the twin of Apollo, you know, the, you know, the, the false god Apollo, okay? Uh, and she was a virgin huntress who supplanted the titan Selena, uh, uh, who was the goddess of the moon. So I find that very interesting that not only is this the fertility goddess, but also the goddess of the moon. 
And as you know, the uh, Islam and what do they worship? The crescent moon, that's their big symbol of worship uh, in our day and age and has been uh, throughout the history uh, in the uh, last thousand years or so. But ultimately, you see the false god and the pagan goddess and ultimately people worshiping her. And again, this is another artist's rendition of uh, what would be going on with sacrifices and uh, different things. And, you know, uh, as you know, with many of these false god religions, and especially the goddesses of fertility and things like that, uh, not only would they commit sacrifices to her, but, you know, prostitution was a big part of these, both male and female prostitutes, and sex was a big part of this. Again, the goddess of fertility, uh, you know, uh, uh, standing for that. So, again, we see that she's distinctive from this. Again, I, I just read this. I thought this slide was coming up, so sorry about that. Uh, but I showed you a picture instead. But ultimately, uh, you know, this is the, 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 the uh, goddess that we're talking about. And this is uh, two pictures. One on the left is something that was found in one of the ancient or one of the uh, uh, more modern archaeological digs of the ancient carving of the goddess Artemis. And then on the right-hand side, you see a drawing of what would be a wooden uh, carving of that goddess as well. And what's interesting about her is uh, right up here around the chest area where you see all these things going on. And ultimately, they all are considered to be various breasts and which represented the fertility of this woman, okay? And so again, they would, uh, you know, pray to her if they wanted to have children. They would probably sacrifice children to her at different times. And again, uh, you know, bow down, pray, worship, do all these different things and honor her as the goddess of fertility in all realms, whether it be animal or uh, 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 um, um, uh, human life, uh, whatever the case may be. All right, so let me give you a little bit more about the history. Okay, so you know, being on the coast of Ionia, again, uh, back in the ancient day, as we have in Turkey and then Greek, uh, th that region was also first known as the Ionian region, and again, built on that coast of Ionia, and Ionia, interestingly, was one of four major tribes that were, you know, the ancient Greeks or Ionians uh, back in that day, and the other would be the Dorians, the, uh, the Aeolians, and the Arcasians. And uh, along with the Ionians, that was the ancient Greek world before it ultimately became Greek, and then also later on become, you know, Spartan and Athians and all the different ones that we are more familiar with. These are the more ancient ones. And so ultimately, it is uh, where the present-day uh, suck uh, Selkuk in uh, Turkey is uh, known. Selkuk in the uh, Izmi province, uh, excuse me, province of Turkey. That is where this is located today. And uh, ultimately, it was also built again in the 10th century BC in the site of the former Arzawan capital by Attic and Ionian Greek colonists. Uh, again, and then in the mid 7th century BC, it was one of the 12 cities of what was known as the Ionian League. And what's the Ionian League? But basically, that Ionian League was a, a group of 12 cities that got together, and they basically formed a confederation so that they could stand strong uh, when uh, uh, opposing armies would come in and try to take them over, as the, the Persians did uh, several times. The Persians would come over and try to take these, uh, these countries and these uh, cities over and then uh, you know, uh, make them part of their Persian empire. And they were successful in that, and Ephesus was under the Persian empire at different times, but ultimately with these confederates that they would build and uh, come together, sometimes they were able to then throw them off or stop them from coming in and taking over their city. So again, they have that confederation called the Ionian League, uh, which helped them to defend against various enemies and armies that wanted to take them over. Here's another uh, archaeological uh, picture, and uh, so if you went over to uh, Turkey and Ephesus today, uh, you would see this uh, coming from the archaeological dig, and again, one of the great streets that are there, and then you can see all the various, uh, let me get my mouse going here again, where is it, oh, I didn't want to do that, let me go back, go back, yep, okay, let's see, let's see, where is the mouse, there's the mouse, okay, but again, just, you know, look at all the various structures that are here in these ruins, all the pillars that are going down, you know, from side to side. And this is the ruins, you know, thousands of years, you know, several thousands of years after these things have been destroyed. 
And so again, if you just think of them all being constructed and built, and again, the architecture that would be there and the beauty that would be there based on that architecture uh, in that day. So a lot of things going on there, you know, a, a city street, city fair, uh, and then again, uh, a lot of construction and uh, beautiful buildings in that area. Now, from a historical standpoint, it's also interesting to note, let me see if it didn't go to the next slide, let me see if I can get it to, hold on just a minute. Stop, you're acting up to me. All right, let's see. Let's just go to the next slide. What's also interesting, let's turn our Bibles, let's go to Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 10. And so again, when we talk about the Ionians and the Ionian Empire, that were pretty much, you know, predecessors to the Greek and the Greek Empire, as we've noted. Ultimately, in Genesis 10, uh, verse 2, we see the genesis of where this Ionian uh, culture came from and the Ionian people came from. And you may not see that when you look at it specifically in the Scripture, but I'm going to point it out to you. So in uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now these are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Jepheth, the sons of Noah, and, uh, and sons were born to them after the flood. So again, as you know, in the flood, only Adam and his three sons survived, and then they went off and they continued to populate the world after that. And they had sons, as you know. And so now we have the, the records of them and the genealogy of them. And in verse 2, it says, The sum of Jepheth were Gomer and Magog and uh, Madai and Javan and Tabul and Meshech and Taras. And it goes on to say then in verse 3, the sons of Gomer, etc., etc. But let's go back to verse 2. The sons of Jepheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, and Javan. Now, we pronounce Javan here in our English as Javan, as I just pronounced it. But ultimately, when you look at it in the Hebrew, and most biblical scholars do absolutely agree that this Javan from Noah's son, the son of Noah's son, ultimately was the one who established this colony. And these are the people of Javan, or as you would say in the Hebrew, Yawan, or in the pearl, Yawanium. So you get ion and you get ionium from that as you translate that from the ancient language and then certainly Hebrew down into their dialect and their language uh, uh, that we have come down to us today. So here we have, again, this Javan, as we would pronounce it in our English. This was the father of the Ionians, who after the Tower of Babel, as you know, the Tower of Babel, God you know, mixed up the languages of the people of the world and then sent them off based on common language to various regions around the world, and then they populated the world in that way. And that's why we have different races and different languages in our world today. So again, uh, Jepheth's son, uh, I, I won, we could say, ultimately is the one who came down to that Asia Minor area, and, uh, or, or his family and his predecessors came down to that area and established the colony that we have there, and ultimately was there during the time also of Paul. So again, a little history of how this uh, people and the Ionians uh, got together and how they came together, and then ultimately uh, continuing on now in Ephesus in the day of Paul. Now, we also note that there was a great theater, as I uh, shared with you. And uh, what's interesting about this great theater, as I told you, it could house up to 24,000 people. 24,000 people could fit into that. Again, you know, you think of today and, you know, many of our great civic centers. I know our football stadiums are a little bigger than that, but most of your civic centers where you play basketball and hockey, that's about the size of what they are, okay? And we have all this equipment and all this machinery and all this. Well, back in the day, they were able to build those stadiums as well, as you know, like the Roman Colosseum and others. But again, 24,000 people uh, could uh, sit in this theater and they would have different plays or this would be a place where speakers would get up and uh, share information. But we also see this coming into play in the book of Acts. So let's go to Acts chapter 19, verse 29. So again, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then you have the book of Acts and the book of Romans.
Now, when you uh, look at the book of Acts, uh, in, in Acts chapter 18, ultimately, uh, you know, well, you know, you see 17, 16, 17, 18, all of those start to talk about Paul's various missionary journeys. And in uh, Acts chapter 18, it talks quite extensively about him being in Ephesus and going to Ephesus during his missionary journey. And then in Acts chapter uh, 18, uh, verse 23, that's the beginning of his third missionary journey. And that continues all the way down into chapter 19 as well. But let's just read, uh, let's go to chapter 18. Let me have you look at chapter 18, verse 23 to start. In verse 23, it says, And having spent some time there, he departed and passed successfully through the Galatian region, which we noted uh, in our study of the book of Galatians this past year, uh, Phrygia, uh, strengthening all, in Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. So again, we see him coming to Ephesus and now talking to uh, and, and talking about uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I won't read uh, much more about that individual, but basically he was a great evangelist and knew from John's ministry that Christ was the Messiah. And then as you see, let's jump down to verse 27, and it says, and, we, and when he wanted to go to Acacia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he helped greatly those who had believed through grace. And in verse 26, it tells us that Priscilla and Aquila were two individuals that met him there in Ephesus and heard him speak. And then they called him aside and said, hey, you've got most of the gospel and most of the doctrine, but let me tell you some more. You know, and that's when they found out he only knew about John's uh, witness of Christ, and ultimately they then told him the greater doctrines and the mystery doctrines for the church age. But then let's jump over to chapter 19, and let's go to, uh, uh, let's see, around verse uh, 29. All right, let's go to verse 24. All right, let me just give you some context. It says, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. So again, this individual would, would create little idols and little different things, you know, for the false goddess uh, Ar 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 Armetius. Excuse me, Artemis, okay? And ultimately uh, made a good profit in doing that. Verse 25, he says, These he gathered together. So he brought all the individuals together because now that Paul was in there and saying, Hey, these are all false gods, you know, follow the God, the Christ, they were losing business and they were, you know, their business was being hurt. So he called all the craftsmen together. And it says, These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trade and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends on this business. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. And not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship should even be dethroned from her magnificence. And you can just say, from her magnificence, dethroned. And then in verse 28, And when they heard this, they were filled with rage. They began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And again, they held this you know, goddess near and dear to their heart. But in verse 29, And the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Again, other individuals that came with him and helping in the ministry and witnessing. Verse 30, And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. And also some of the, the, uh, uh, the Aserachs, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the into the. Uh, into the theater, okay? So again, they dragged him into this theater, and let me show you a picture of what that theater looks like now. Okay, there's one picture and showing just the magnitude of it. And so again, they would take him from the city and they dragged him into that, and then there they would start to accuse him and, you know, you know bring uh, falsehoods against him and whatnot, and ultimately uh, maybe even end up uh, stoning him or killing him uh, if they saw fit. 
All right, so then it says in verse 32, So then some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and the majority did not know for what cause they had come together. Like, why are we here? You know, it's kind of like that mob mentality, which we saw down in Baltimore and we're seeing around the country, you know. You know, a couple of people start to hit the streets, and then before you know it, the streets are filled, and half the people or the majority of the people there don't even know why they're there. But they're just there because it's a riot and it's a ruckus and they probably can do some destructive uh, uh, things while they're there, really not caring about the original cause uh, to begin with. All right, so again, you know, wondering why they had come together. Verse 33, and then some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander since the Jews had put him forward and having motioned with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Can you imagine for two hours? You know, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And then also, what are we finding out? The silversmith was a Jew. And he should have really been worshiping the God of Israel and should have known about these false, false gods and uh, that it was forbidden to worship them in the first place. But we see him going along because, again, the profit that he was making. Then in verse 35, it says, And after quieting the multitude, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there after all who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is a guardian or is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven? Now, that's an interesting uh, phrase because, again, they're thinking that, you know, this all came to us from heaven. We didn't create this. This came down from the sky. You know, this fell down right on top of us, and we're just worshiping what, what, what fell down. Kind of like, you know, a, a counterfeit of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And that's how, again, most of these false religions started, counterfeits to uh, what uh, was being preached in regard to the true Messiah. In verse 36, it says, Since, since then... These are undeniable facts. You ought to keep calm and do nothing rash, for you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. So then if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and proconsul are available. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in a, the lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's affairs. Since there is no real cause for it, and in this connection, we shall be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. And after saying this, he dismissed the assembly. Now, another thing we also have to keep in mind is at this point in time during, you know, uh, 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 Paul's uh, 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 missionary journeys in the early church, who was in charge? The Romans. And remember, the Romans allowed all these little cities to govern themselves as they did with the Israelites in Jerusalem. But if a riot started or if any kind of uproar started to occur, what would happen? The Romans would come in and they'd put a stop to it right then and there. And if too many of these things occurred... Again, they wouldn't be able to self-govern under Roman authority. The Romans would come in and dictate and be authoritative to them. So, again, we see them kind of, uh, you know, again, at least one individual coming in a, uh, you know, in a, 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 a societal way of bringing in lawlessness and trying to bring pre peace to the situation and trying to use the legitimate courts of their day as we've been talking about in the book of Proverbs, but ultimately these uh, individuals were trying to riot and get rid of these, uh, these Christians that had come in that were preaching the way of Jesus Christ because it was hurting their business and hurting their pockets. So again, wanting to get rid of them. So we see that here as part of Paul's missionary journeys and part of the accounts that happened uh, during that time and some of the things he had to deal with uh, as well. So, uh, continuing on a little bit more about the city. Again, the city has a long history of being ruled independently, 
you know, that sometimes they, they govern themselves, but also has, a, you know, a great history of one army or one empire after another coming in and taking them over, uh, like the Greek army coming in, like the Persians, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the Medo-Persian empire under Darius uh, coming in or Cyrus coming in and taking them over as well. Uh, also, ultimately, then during Paul's day and age, and when the Roman empire came up, the Romans came in and took them over and ruled the city. So again, a lot of uh, you know, history of back and forth, sometimes self-governing, sometimes other people being in control of the city. So there's always been uh, you know, some chaos going on and various warfares throughout their history as well. But the city really started to flourish under the Roman Empire. And once the Roman Empire came in and kind of you know, brought peace and you know, settled the place and then used it as a major port of trade and bringing things across the Aegean Sea and then over also into Asia Minor as well. And according to some, they had a population of anywhere from 33,600 all the way up to 56,000 uh, people, what we would call a town or you know, a large town or small city uh, in our country today. So again, back in the ancient day, that was a, a quite a large city as well. Again, as I have on the board, making it the third largest in the Roman Empire in Asia Minor, second only to Sardis and uh, Alexandria, Troas as we know. So we know that this was an important political uh, uh, venue, important educational venue. Again, with the library there, you know, much education was going on, important uh, commercial and uh, trade center, as well as, uh, as we know, an important religious center of the secular world and of the pagan world back in the day. And it only rivaled the Alexandria of Egypt and also Antioch of uh, uh, Pisidi uh, that we know about in South uh, Asia Minor uh, as well. So again, it had that harbor. I showed you that picture of the harbor that came in, but there was a problem with that harbor. harbor. Another river flowed into that as well as also the sea was there. And what happened is a lot of silt would get flushed down from the land coming down that river. And what it did was basically, you know, fill up the harbor. And if you've ever seen any pictures of like the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Mississippi River and where it then you know, dumps into the uh, Gulf of Mexico down in Louisiana and you see all that, that silt that comes down and then how it's made all these various islands and kind of blocked it up a little bit from you know, the main uh, uh, thoroughfare and be able to flow in and out smoothly. Well, that's what happened to uh, the Great Bay and, and, and the, uh, the Great uh, Port here in Ephesus. It basically got filled up with silt. And so during the time of the New Testament and the Roman Empire, it started to be a city that was in decline because of the silt filling up the harbor, boats and not being able to get in there and out of there very easily. So again, it was losing a lot of its prominence uh, during the New Testament days, but yet still you know, a, great, uh, a great place of uh, you know, trade, commercial, travel, and all those kind of things. In fact, it's a marketplace of the Agora that I showed you on the map is known by some as to be the Vanity Fair of their day. And an individual, an ancient writer called Herodotus says, the Ionians of Asia have built their cities in a region where the air and climate are the most beautiful in the whole world. For no other region is equally blessed with Ionia or as Ionia. So it goes on to say, for in other countries, either the climate is over cold and damp or else the heat and drought are sorely oppressive. So this was a beautiful climate, very, you know, moderate climate, both, uh, you know, uh, good rains and then also uh, not overly damp, as it said, but ultimately just a great place to live uh, back in the day. So therefore, it was one of the very populated cities of that day. Now, Today, if you were to go to that city, that harbor that used to be there is no longer there. It's now been completely filled in and uh, built upon, uh, as we've done in the kind of in the Back Bay of Boston. If you know anything about the Back Bay, it used to be a swampy area and whatnot. Now they've filled it all in, and they've basically built all kinds of buildings and uh, thoroughfare uh, through that area. But ultimately, uh, you know, was a great city at one time. You know, somewhat in decline during Paul's day, but still, you know, a very important city and a very important region. And as we noted previously, Paul lived there for over two years uh, after his third missionary journey. He made it the central place of his evangelistic ministry, outreaching to all the other provinces that are there uh, in what was called Asia Minor, Turkey as we know today. 
And so again, from a Christian standpoint, it is a very prominent place. Uh, and uh, it's interesting how Paul went to the most, one of the most pagan places in all of the ancient world, and he said, this is where I'm going to establish the church. You know, let's go right here. And that's what he did, you know. And then where was the other place? Rome. The other, the other place he went to was Rome, the second and uh, maybe the greatest of uh, the pagan worship, although the Greeks uh, had their great in Athens and places like that. But Paul went there too. You know? He wasn't afraid. And he wasn't afraid to be challenged by the false religions and the pagan gods. He, wasn't, he didn't care about what they thought and what they uh, were all about, but he ultimately went to those places to give them the truth of the gospel message. Just as you and I, as you know, we live uh, in a region of our country which is the most pagan within the entire country. And again, uh, I showed you some statistics on that last year. Again, the least biblically literate in all of the country. But again, we should not be afraid or ashamed of the gospel message and should be very bold as we go out and deal with the various religions that are found in this area and the false religions that are uh, popping up throughout uh, the region as well and preach the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, as we've noted, again, it was one of the seven wonders of the seven world, excuse me, of the ancient world, but it was also one of what? The seven letters that Paul, the apostle Paul wrote, to the seven churches in the book of Revelation in chapter 2 and chapter 3. So, again, a lot of sevens are included in that, which talks about spiritual perfection uh, in that city. And it's interesting that when we go through the book of Ephesians, we're going to see a lot of sevens there as well, too, which continues to talk about that spiritual perfection uh, of, of our Lord, as the number seven speaks to that throughout Scripture. So again, the Apostle John wrote uh, uh, one of his letters to the seven churches to that uh, place of Ephesus, and also it was a headquarter for John in the latter part of his ministry, and it's uh, 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 probable that he wrote his gospel, and, and the epistle of 1 John was probably also written to the people at Ephesus, even though it does not mention them, but uh, ultimately uh, the gospel of John being written uh, from that place. All right, so that gives us a little bit about the history of uh, what's going on there. Uh, you know, some of the more, I won't say modern history, but post-biblical or uh, post-early church history is that uh, in the 5th century, there was a Christian council, or many Christian councils were at Ephesus. So even in the early church in the 500s and the, the, four, the 400s and the 500s AD, many councils gathered at Ephesus and determined various doctrines and solidified doctrines for the early church at those places. Also, if you were to visit that uh, area, there's a large gladiator graveyard that is in that place as well. And as we had uh, showed you, the, uh, not the theater, but also the stadium where they would have uh, gladiator fights and battles from time to time. If you also went there today, you would see the Basilica of John, uh, the Apostle John there as well. Again, a church uh, in honor of him and in honor of his ministry being there for many years. And as you know, uh, uh, Ephesus is still a, a favorite uh, a travel destination for tourists because of the ancient ruins there and also for many Christians because of the early church being established uh, from that location as well. All right, so uh, uh, when we talk about the book of Ephesus and uh, the, book of, excuse me, the book of Ephesians, as we talk about that, uh, just to remind you, in the book of Acts chapter 18 and also in chapter 19, in Paul's second and third missionary journeys, we can read about Ephesus and some of the things that Paul did there. And then also, not only the book of Ephesians, but also in Re uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, is that one of the seven letters to the seven churches that John, the Apostle John, wrote to the, that people. All right, and then I'm going to leave you with this graphic tonight, and then uh, we'll pick it up on Sunday morning. But basically, a little bit of a timeline in regard to the writing of the book of Ephesians. And so if we could uh, just see that a little bit. Let me just get uh, my mouse onto the slide, okay? So basically, what we have here is... Uh, you know, uh, Paul's conversion, which happened around 33 A.D., okay, about a few years after uh, the resurrection of Christ, although, you know, Christ could have been here at 33, you know, the numbers, as you know, are off by a couple of years, but, you know, around the time of uh, several years after Christ. Uh, then you see various things. I don't know if you can read that, so I'm not going to go through all of this because you can't really read it you know, too well, but you can see it in your notes. 
But basically, we come up to here, and between 61 and 63 uh, AD, we see the books of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon uh, being written. And then in 70 AD is the year that the Romans finally came in and overthrew Jerusalem and totally destroyed uh, Jerusalem and the temple and then uh, uh, dispersed and had the great dis- uh, d- dispersion, dispersed the, uh, the Jews throughout the entire world at that time, no longer be able to go to Jerusalem for their worship until 1948. So... All right, that's a little bit of the history of uh, Ephesus and the Ephesian people. And uh, so now that we have some background, now we can get into what the book is all about. And uh, we'll be able to recall uh, many of these things as we uh, talk about the various aspects of Paul's writing uh, during, uh, in the book of Ephesians. Uh, so it'll give us a, a greater understanding of what he was up against in that day as well. All right, so uh, let's just close in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity to learn a little bit about the history of uh, the ancient days and the time in which uh, your church was established that we are uh, continuing to reap the fruits and the benefits from. And Father, we ask that you help us to remember the history and the struggles and the turmoil and the obstacles and uh, uh, opposition that the uh, ancient uh, people were up against as they established the church. Paul and the various apostles and missionaries and also the great Gentiles that were raised up to start the early church, Father. We just thank you for bringing them before us and giving them strength and comfort by your word and by your spirit to go forward so that ultimately we could have the heritage that we are so richly enjoying today. So, Father, we pray that you continue to lead us and guide us, give us travel blessings on your way home, and continue to give us strength as we go out into the world and in our every day, as we go into work tomorrow or wherever we may be tomorrow, to be bold and strong, preaching the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, not being ashamed or worried about what people think, but ultimately being bold and strong and telling people that about the Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you for this time. In Christ's name, amen.